right, <clears throat> we're in the book of Revelation, and we're in chapter 14. Um, as we approach the end, uh, waiting for the judgments that were signaled by the blowing of the seventh trumpet in chapter 11, verse 15, the Lord once again demonstrates his amazing mercy and compassion because he sends to the world <clears throat> three angels which bring to the world as they fly through the heavens the gospel. The gospel invitation before it's too late and a warning of what will happen if it's rejected. We saw in chapter 14, verse 6, the first angel with what was described as the everlasting gospel. It is everlasting good news, but it is good news of everlasting life. <laughs> and we saw that um, it is not only the gospel that brings everlasting life, it is the gospel that gives you entrance into God's kingdom. It is the gospel of Jesus Christ who makes it all possible by his life, death, and resurrection. It is the gospel of God because it is the center of his redemptive plan. It is the gospel of grace because it is those who are totally undeserving who receive this gospel by faith. It is the gospel of glory because it will take you from sin and perdition to glory. And it manifests his glory as we see his attributes in it. It's the gospel of salvation. It'll save you from hell. It's the gospel of peace because by it you can have peace with your God and experience his peace. It is, as Paul says in 1 Timothy, the glorious gospel. And it's proclaimed, and the angel proclaims it in a loud voice. Let's begin. Let's read Revelation 14, beginning in verse 6. Then I saw another angel flying in the midst of heaven, having the everlasting gospel to preach to those who dwell on the earth, to every nation tribe, tongue, and people saying with a loud voice, fear God and give him glory for the, for the hour of his judgment has come and worship him who made heaven and earth, the sea and the springs of water. And another angel followed saying, Babylon has fallen, has fallen that great city because she has made all nations drink of the wine of the wrath of her fornication. And then a third angel followed them, saying with a loud voice, If anyone worships the beast in his image and receives his mark on his forehead or on his hand, he himself shall also drink of the wine of the wrath of God, which is poured out full strength into the cup of his indignation. He shall be tormented with fire and brimstone in the presence of the holy angels and in the presence of the Lamb. And the smoke of their torment ascends forever and ever. And they have no rest, day or night, who worship the beast and his image and who receive the mark of his name. Here is the patience of the saints. Here are those who keep the commandments of God and the faith of Jesus Christ. Then I heard a voice from heaven saying to me, Write, blessed are the dead who die in the Lord from now on. Yes, says the Spirit, that they may rest from their labors and their works follow them. It is um, a fearful thing to fall into the hands of the living God. But he is a compassionate God. He is a merciful God. And that's why this angel is flying through heaven, making sure that everyone hears the everlasting gospel. As we said last time, God is not waiting for man to get the gospel to the whole world before he can finish his plan. He is going to do it supernaturally. 
and it is a gospel that is to go to all people, every nation, tribe, tongue, and people. And in this amazing supernatural act, very near the end, this angel is going to speak in a loud voice. I just want you to understand this is a loud voice because everyone's going to hear it. No one's going to miss it. You will not have an excuse at the end, but I never heard. And the gospel has an interesting content to it as it's proclaimed by this angel. He says, um, Fear God and give Him glory. And we talked about that last time. That is where the gospel begins. The gospel begins when you see who God is, and when you see who He is, you understand that He is holy and righteous and perfect. And then you see yourself that you are sinful, a rebel against Him and against His holiness. You must see Him to rightly receive the gospel, and you must see yourself to rightly receive the gospel because you need to understand the need for the gospel. You must see your helpless and hopeless state before a holy God so that you can seek his mercy. And that's what the gospel is. It's the good news of the mercy of God because of his son, Jesus and what he has done. And we saw and talked about last time. It is interesting. That is actually amazing how many things men and women are afraid of. They're just not afraid of the right thing. They're just not afraid of the living God, although scripture is clear. He is a consuming fire. So the first thing you have to do is fear God. And then the second thing you have to do is give him glory. And what does that mean? Well, it means you've responded rightly to him. He has revealed himself, who he is, and what he is going to do. And you must rightly respond. If you rightly respond, you are said to give him glory. Now, you're not adding to his glory, but you are giving him glory in the sense of you are acknowledging who he reveals himself to be. And we talked about this before. It's called ascribed glory. It is what all men are called to do. It is what their purpose is. So how do you give him glory? Well, you respond rightly to the gospel. You fear God. <laughs> and that fear seeks his mercy. And that mercy requires your repentance and your trust. And you do that. You turn from your sin. You put your faith and trust in the Lord Jesus Christ. You submit to him. And by that, you can love him and worship him. That's what he deserves, and that's what he commands. And that's what the gospel is. Fear God and give him glory. <clears throat> Excuse me. Now, one thing I wanted to mention, and <clears throat> we didn't talk about last time, is <clears throat> the fear of God that this angel is calling the world to is, mark it, fear God. Be terrified of your current state before the creator of the universe who is holy and righteous and just. But that is not the fear that God calls us to, those who are in his family. For us, fear is better understood as an awesome reverence awe of him. It's a reverence that draws you to him. 
a reverence that draws from us our love and our worship and our service. It is an awe that moves us to desire to honor Him in all things. <clears throat> and although there is a proper fear that God calls us to, that is not just in awe, and that is a fear of the chastening hand of our Father. <clears throat> Hebrews 12, 5 says He chastens those that He loves. And I don't know about you, but I'd just as soon not be there if I can help it. But it is never, it is never the fear of condemnation. Because there is no condemnation, Romans 8.1 says, for those that are in Christ Jesus. It is the difference between our relationship with our God as our Father and the relationship we had with God before we came through the gospel to Him when He was our judge. So, fearing God for us is a good thing, but it's not the fear of eternal judgment. It's simply the fear of displeasing our Father. It's simply the fear of facing His righteous, loving chastening. And it is at all points an awe of Him that drives us to fully submit our lives to Him for His glory. That's what He deserves. And who better to understand that than those who have been transformed and saved by the Gospel? Verse 8, then another angel followed, saying, Babylon is fallen, is fallen, that great city, because she has made all nations drink of the wine of her wrath, of the wrath of her fornication. Babylon, I think, is best seen as the world's <laughs> evil, spiritual, and political empire under the Antichrist. We said last time it could be the revived city of Babylon, but we won't go back there again. It looked really promising when Saddam Hussein was rebuilding it before he had a slight attitude adjustment. <coughs> but either way, it is a picture and has been a picture, a symbol of evil and rebellion against God for as long as it has existed because it drives back to Genesis chapter 10 in Genesis chapter 10 We are introduced. Uh, we are introduced uh, to a man, beginning in verse uh, eight. Then Cush begot Nimrod, and he began to be a mighty one on the earth, and he was a mighty hunter before the Lord. Therefore, it is said, like Nimrod, the mighty hunter before God, and the beginning of his kingdom was Babel. Eric, Akkad, and Kalneth in the land of Shinar. From that land, he went to Assyria and built Nineveh. It is, um, it is this man, Nimrod, who is a mighty man and a man who puts together a very a powerful rebellion against God because he draws people together and he draws them together to do what is right in their own eyes and to worship a false god. In, verse, in chapter 11, 
Now the whole earth had one language and one speech, and it came to pass as they journeyed from east, they found a plain in the land of Shinar, and they dwelt there, and they said to one another, Come, let us make bricks and bake them thoroughly. They had brick for stone, and they had asphalt for mortar, and they said, Come, let us build ourselves a city, a tower whose top is in the heavens. Let us make a name for ourselves, lest we be scattered abroad over the face of the earth. But that's what they were supposed to do. They were supposed to scatter. They were supposed to subdue the earth, be fruitful and multiply, and fill up the earth. But they've come together in their city to make a name for themselves. And in their prideful idolatrous ways led by this man Nimrod they build a tower to get to heaven a tower to reach the heavens man's effort to get to God on his own it is the beginning of idolatrous false worship and its name is the Tower of Babel. In a very real sense it's the first of the ziggurats. We have great evidence of these towers throughout Mesopotamia built to worship false gods. To carry out religious practices that are mystical as man tries to get to God on his own with a priesthood and with sacrifices. And these towers date back 4,000 years or more. It's, it's, what God do, oh, it's what man does. He is disobedient in his life, and he is disobedient in his relationship with his God, and this is a beginning point. Yeah. So the Lord said, indeed, the people are one, and they all have one language, and this is what they begin to do. Now nothing that they propose to do will be withheld from them. They're going to do whatever they want. They're not going to submit, submit to their God. They're off on their own. They're going to create their own religion. They're going to create their own gods. And that's what man has done. And the plethora of gods that has flown out of Babylon, we'll get into in more detail when we look at this in chapter 17, because it is identified as the mother of harlots. So God says, let us, which I think is an interesting... <coughs> An, in, an interesting um, reference to what is his Trinitarian nature. Let's confuse their language that they may not understand another speech. So the Lord scattered them, verse 8, from abroad, from over the face of the earth, and they ceased building the city. And therefore its name is called Babel, because there the Lord confused the languages of all the earth and scattered them. Isn't that um, interesting? God told man to be fruitful and multiply and subdue the earth. Man said, no, we're going to hang out together and do whatever we want. And we're going to make up our own gods and we're going to build towers to get up to heaven. Create false worship of our false gods. Have you ever given any thought to uh, how much effort the world has made in our lifetimes to get back together? In a very real sense, the world, as it defines its problems, believes that the solution to those problems is for us to come together. 
in one world. Now, I, I'll grant you that there is a fight against that, and some of that fight is more or less successful now than it was 10 years ago. But as an overarching view of the world, you have to believe that those big thinkers in the world can only see one ultimate solution to the world's problems, and that is one world. We need a one world government. We need to bake, break down the economic and cultural and religious barriers that keep us apart. We need to be unified. Uh, we see it in the European Union. We see it in international commerce and the interrelationship between um, businesses conducting business all over the world. It is not so much that a, that a business is anymore headquartered in a particular country and identified with that country. It more or less identifies with the world. We see it in an attempt to have a common currency. We see it um, less evident but still there trying to have a common language which by the way is pretty much English. But I, I, I like to watch, uh, no, not a lot, but I like to watch New Year's celebrations and listen to the pundits. And you go from one city to the next and we're all shooting off fireworks and all of it, all of it is one world talk. One world talk. The world's answer to the world's problems is the world coming together. And they're going to get their wish. <laughs> they're going to get their wish. We may have little ups and downs in between. <laughs> but ultimately, this one Antichrist is simply going to fulfill the desires of the world to come back together again. It's Babel all over. But far far worse. So this then is the final Babylon that has fallen. Interesting, it, past tense language for something that hasn't actually happened in the text yet. But if God says it, it's going to happen. So he uses the past tense regularly in the present because it's the same. It says it is this Babylon that is fallen, that great city, because she has made all the nations drink of the wine of the wrath of her fornication. It is, um, it is unmixed wine. You know, in ancient world, uh, the, the wine used to be mixed. As much as 10 to 1, it was diluted with, with uh, water uh, to create a drink that was commonly drunk by most of the people. It helped because there wasn't a lot of purified water around and this was a, a way to drink something that was not harmful. So when you see wine in the Bible, generally speaking, it's diluted wine, um, very diluted. Um, and you have to understand that when you, when you look at the language that is going to be here because you're going to drink the full fury of the cup of the wine of the wrath of God unmixed because she has made all the nations drink of the wine of the wrath of her fornication. Wrath is coming against her fornication, her immorality and her spiritual immorality. The sinfulness of this world and its abject rebellion against the one true God. Babylon has fallen because of its idolatrous passions, its rebellion against God and instead of drinking of its passions and its immorality and its false religion it is going to drink still this time from the cup of the wrath of God <coughs> that 
And a third angel followed them, saying with a loud voice, If anyone worships a beast in his image and receives the mark on his forehead or on his hand, he also shall also drink of the wine of the wrath of God. And here it is, is poured out full strength. If you align yourself with this evil system, if you voluntarily become part of Antichrist's world, if you identify by taking the mark, you set yourself up to drink not of the wine of the fornication and pleasures that that system offers you. You are going to drink of the wrath of God full force, unmitigated, undiluted. He shall be tormented with fire and brimstone in the presence of the holy angels and in the presence of the Lamb. The full fury of God. It, interesting, David speaks of something like that in Psalm 75. In his judgment, in verse 8, and in the hand of the Lord there is a cup, and the wine is red. It is fully mixed, and he pours it out. Surely its dregs shall all the wicked of the earth drain and drink down. It is the wrath of God that will represent his indignation and result in torment, verse 10, with fire and brimstone. That isn't, that isn't exactly the music I would have picked. <laughs> Uh, the cup of his indignation, torment, ceaseless agony. Uh, it, 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 we get a little picture of it in um, Luke 16. Uh, verse 23, Lazarus and the rich man. It says, and being in torment in Hades, he, is lifted, he lifted up his eyes and saw Abram far off and Lazarus in his bosom. And he cried and said, Father Abraham, have mercy on me. And said, Lazarus, that I may dip the tip of his finger in water and cool my tongue, for I am tormented in this flame. And Abram said, Son, remember that in your lifetime you received good things, and likewise Lazarus evil, but now he is comforted and you are tormented. And this is Hades. This is the precursor to the ultimate torment, to the ultimate pain and agony, which is the lake of fire. And fire is just always around God's judgment. I mean, it was fire and brimstone that he rained down on Sodom and Gomorrah for their unrepentant evil. It is similarly Psalm 11. In verse 6, upon the wicked 
He will rain coals of fire and brimstone and burning wind shall be a portion of their cup. The, the imagery is so clear. The, the wrath of God is poured out against willful rebels, immoral, idolatrous people of the world who have rejected his continual call to the gospel. And ultimately, this fire judgment, this cup of his wrath will be poured out in full measure in the lake of fire, which is the destination of all who fail to repent and come to him. In verse 11 it says, and the smoke of their torment ascends forever and ever, and they have no rest day or night who worship the beast and his image, whoever receives the mark of his name. It's just a mark of the unbeliever. It's the mark of those who have given their allegiance to the Antichrist rather than to God, have rejected all the calls of God because of their desire to save their own life and participate in the darkness that they desire. And the torment is forever. Hell is forever. I mean, I know you know that, but let me show you a verse that is as profound as any. Matthew chapter 25. You know, there are uh, false teachers, even people that claim to be Christians now that try to sell the idea that nobody's going to hell or Hell's not forever, or love wins. <laughs> love that. But let's just look at what Jesus says about it. Matthew 25 and 40, 41. Then he shall also say to those on the left, Depart from me, you cursed, into everlasting fire, prepared for the devil and his angels. This is a place man chooses to go. It wasn't originally in, created for him, created for the devil, but man, <coughs> loving his darkness, ends up here, literally chooses this because he rejects all the offers to escape it. But you are cursed, and you go to everlasting fire. Look at verse 46. And, to, and these will go away into the, its everlasting fire up here, its everlasting punishment in verse 46. But the righteous to eternal life. Here's the deal. The same word for everlasting in verse 46 is used for the word eternal in verse 46. Same verse. Hell and the punishment of it will last as long as the eternal blessedness for those who are believers. In Matthew 9, Jesus describes it as the place where the fire is never quenched and the worm never dies. In Matthew chapter 13 and verse 42 and 50, it is a furnace of fire and there will be wailing and gnashing of teeth. This fire doesn't take you out of existence. This is just something that describes your agony. Physical agony and emotional agony. Physical, clear, on fire is... To be burned by fire is exceedingly painful. But there's an emotional agony there, too, that, that just can't be ignored. Um, and, and this is something that I, you know, I heard a sermon on not too long ago. I thought it was so profound. You, you know, in Romans chapter 2, in verse 15, Uh, 
um, God indicting all of mankind and indicating that man is guilty with or without the gospel. Man is guilty because he's a sinner and he rejects the evidence of God in his creation and in the law that he puts in his heart. Says this in verse 15. They are guilty because they show the work of the law written in their hearts, their conscience also bearing witness, and between them their thoughts accusing and excusing them. The conscience that God puts in every man gives him the understanding of right and wrong. That is intended to draw him to the source of rightness, God. He should look up and see the Creator in his creation, and he should understand in his own heart that there has to be someone who is ultimately right and good to seek after. But this point is interesting. The purpose of the conscience that everyone has is to either excuse them, that is, if you're living rightly by the standards that God has provided, you will not be accused. If you're living against him, your conscience, what is in you, will accuse you. Have you ever been accused by your conscience? <laughs> now, if anybody's ever lived on this planet unsaved for any length of time, you will have experienced what it is to be accused by your conscience. But sinful man is successful in putting it down, in covering it up, in essentially destroying it by living against it for so long, so that over a period of time, it doesn't <coughs> do its job in the life of an abject sinner. But here, in this state, in hell, you will have a perfect conscience. Not only will you experience the exceeding physical pain of something like fire, but you are going to constantly be accused by the conscience that is in you, unrestricted, unimpeded, with no ability to cover it up or to shut it up. But I don't think even that is the ultimate agony of hell. I don't think fire is the ultimate agony. I don't think a cleansed, accusing conscience is the ultimate agony. I think the ultimate agony is you will never escape. There is absolutely no hope. Well, there's another aspect to hell. Matthew 8.12 says it's outer darkness. Have you ever spent any time in total darkness? You ever been down in Carlsbad Caverns or someplace and they turn the light off? How long, how long can you stay comfortable? <laughs> it's interesting uh, when you think of this aspect of hell that there are um, a lot of people, some scholars, that say uh, darkness can't be literal. It can't be a literal darkness because fire can't burn without light. I hope, I don't know where those people got their theological degrees, but I wouldn't go there. Look, you're going to go to heaven with what? A glorified body. It is not going to be the body you currently live in. It is going to be a new body, body fitted for eternity. Similarly, all those in hell are going to have a new body. Not a body consumed by fire. Not a body that wears out or deteriorates. A body fitted for torment in hell. That's a whole different life principle. You don't think God can create fire without light? <laughs> no. I don't. I, I, I heard a, uh, a great sermon one time that said, okay, let's assume that fire doesn't mean literal fire and darkness doesn't mean a literal darkness. 
but this theologian said, but you have to understand something. When symbolic language is used, it is used not to make the reality less than what it is, but to make the reality worse than what it is. In other words, the worst thing we can describe is darkness and fire, but if it is a to mean something else, it doesn't mean something less, it means something worse. Something worse. But with all that said, the focus here really has to be back on the amazing mercy and compassion of God. He keeps offering <laughs> to people that are just rebellious to the very end. People that hate him, blaspheme him in their false religion, in their worship of a man, in their horrible lifestyle, in their continual rejection of his gospel, and he keeps offering. <coughs> we have an amazing God, and it's true for us, particularly all of us who have loved ones that don't know the Lord. We just have to keep praying and always recognize that God is a compassionate, loving God. And if, God forbid, our loved ones end up here, it is because they have rejected and continually rejected. Verse 12 Here is the patience of the saints. Here are those who keep the commandments of God and the faith of Jesus Christ. The angels have warned all those on the earth, but most have rejected, but not all. Not all. Here is the perseverance of the saint. Through all the evil, all the persecution, here are the ones who are faithful, who have kept the commandments of God and the faith of Jesus. These are the ones who have persevered through it all. And perseverance is a fantastic characteristic. It is an attribute of real faith. It is evidence of real faith. It is commanded by God and it is guaranteed by God. And we'll have to get into that next time. Too much to talk about. Let's pray. Father, thank you for our time together. Thank you for your word just seems like um, we find judgment everywhere, but that's what's going to happen in the end. We don't want to overstate it or understate it. We clearly don't want to be afraid of it because you have saved us from it. We clearly don't want it to dominate our life so that we can't function, and yet at the same time, we want it to be part of our thought process as we realize the importance of your gospel. For until the angels come and fly through the sky with a gospel, Lord, we are your people. We are your spokespersons. It is we who possess this gospel that can save lost people from unimaginable torment and suffering. All deserved, Lord, but we don't want anybody to go there. We know we're only saved by your unmerited favor. We know you could place your favor on anyone. We want to be those who take your gospel to all and pray fervently that you would save them before it's too late. Thank you that you are loving, compassionate, and merciful. We're the evidence of it, Lord. 
Help us to live out our lives in awe of you, desiring to honor you and glorify you and worship you and serve you because we love you, Lord. Thank you, Jesus. In your name we pray. Amen.